These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines, for you abandon the commandment of God to hold on to human tradition. Jesus is talking to a group of Pharisees who were always looking for something that he was doing that they could attack. They didn't like to. And they were always looking for, again, either he or his disciples in something that, that, that didn't quite fit their religious system. And so this had to do with the washing of hands and the pots and, and all of those kinds of laws that were in the Jewish traditional laws, but they were not really the heart of the law. So Jesus really uh, just kind of unbraided them. You hypocrites. You worship me with your lips, but you really, your hearts are far from me. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, how our, you know, our religious stuff, or even anything else in this world becomes more important than the real heart of the matter, and that is, that is our heart for God and our heart for others, which is most important. We're going to go into, in these next couple of weeks, some of the harder uh, teachings of the scripture. Remember, we've been on this quest uh, all summer long of, of God, I don't get it. The hard teachings are pretty clear, but we sometimes don't get it. <laughs> we need to listen to them. We've just spent five weeks talking about the grace of God, the love of God, the, the, the blessing of God that He pours into us. And now we're going to spend a few weeks on, on us, our behaviors, our what does God really want from us? And so, brace yourselves. It's not that bad, but brace yourselves. Some of the reasons why we don't understand the Bible and some of the things it says, uh, because it's, it has some paradoxes in it. How many know what a paradox is besides our teachers? <laughs> paradox is basically something that is made up of two opposite things that seem impossible to bring together, but they're both true. A statement that seems to say two opposite things, but are true. And in the scriptures, there are ways in which we hear the word of God that, uh, that we can, uh, that, that seems to be paradoxes. And that's where we really don't understand. Here's, here's for an example. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says, It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our salvation comes, and we've been talking about this for the last four, four or five weeks, doesn't come from how we can't earn our way into heaven. We can't earn favor with God. He loves you right where you are, right as you are. And he won't love you any more or any less. But does he approve of you any more or less? That's the, that's the issue that we're going to look at. No, we, and, and I'm very, very confident that what we were teaching on achieving our status with God versus receiving our status in this world and with God, we receive it. It's grace. We don't have to earn our way along. Does that mean, though, that we should not do good works? Or do they matter? And that's the question of the day. Paul said again in Romans, he said, For we maintain that man is not justified by faith, apart from works of the law, or is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. So even following all the laws, that doesn't make us justified before God. Grace does. Jesus died for our sins, his forgiveness. And so we're talking about justification and salvation. Those are free gifts of God to be received. But does behavior matter? Just because we receive and are justified, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to obtain everything from God. Does it matter? Does it mean that we can do whatever we want? Paul is very clear. He said, by no means does your freedom mean that you can just live life like the world lives. Although, again, we're called to repent and, and we're called to turn to God. There is something about the gospel that wants to change us. He wants to change our behavior. Why? Because Christians, and you and me that are Christians, are called, our whole, our purpose is to reflect 
the very nature and the glory and the holiness of God in our lives. And it begins by what we say. It begins by what we do. It begins how we treat other people. It begins how we forgive. All of these things are the attributes of God, and that's really our purpose. So it does matter to God. And James came along. He was the, he was the, uh, the head of the church in Jerusalem. Most believe that it was Jesus' brother who was converted, actually, after Jesus rose from the dead. And James wrote a letter that is very corrective of behavior. And, and it seems like it goes in, in opposition, that paradox between all of the letters of Paul who said, you know, it's not by works, it's not by works, it's not by works. James, today we heard be... Hey, we're not going to pull this thing felt funny. I had it on upside down. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> James had a church that was that was uh, not acting godly. They were under attack. They were they were doing things that uh, that were really not a, approved. And so he said, "Wait a minute, people! Don't just be hearers of the word." But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. That means do what, what God calls you to do. Obedience is a very important part of our discipleship. I love the way the NIV, the different translations said it. It said, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And that was very fat. Do what it says. So behavior matters. We just can't live like the devil. And represent God. God wants to change us. Now Martin Luther, I don't know if you knew Martin Luther was a great, uh, uh, you know, began the Lutheran church, really had a problem with James. He, he said famously that the uh, book of James was an epistle of straw. And what he had a problem with is he said it was all about law. It's all about what you do. It's all about corrective behavior. It didn't have any grace in it. But here's the point that I want to make, and I really believe that James made. You want to receive grace, we, we need to exude it also. Because it's in doing that, that we really show forth God. So it has a lot of grace. And by the way, he said it's contrary to Jesus' teaching about the free grace that we get. But I wanted to look at a couple of things where Jesus talks about behavior. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who, what? Does the will of my Father. That's doing, isn't it? Who is in heaven. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Go away from me. He said that even after they said, well, we prophesied in your name. We did all the religious things that you called us to. We gathered together. We, but he said, I never knew you because you're not doing the will of my Father. Later on, Jesus in that same uh, chapter said this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and ignores them, no, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And then he goes on to say, and then when the storm comes, the whole foundation is wiped away. Doing and being. So James, in his letter to the church that is not doing, deals with, uh, with I think, what is the greatest advice that we can share. Uh, and I wish I would follow this daily. We heard it today. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen Slow to speak and slow to anger. Does anybody in here wish out of a sense that you could get the words back or out of your mouth? Know? I am guilty of that more times than I could even imagine. And then I go, oh, can I, I'm sorry. I, can I take that back? No, they're out there. Some even say, count to ten before you say something, especially if you're ready to say something that might be damaging. Because then you are not speaking out of, out of your anger or emotion or the like. 
For your anger doesn't produce God's righteousness at all. Good advice. So what is the thing that he's talking about being quick to listen, so to speak? What is it that gets me, <laughs> you probably in trouble with anything else? If any of you think you're religious and do not bridle your tongue, I'll personalize it, but deceive the hearts that religion is worthless. Is that a strong, strong statement? If you think you're religious and do not bridle your tongue, the tongue and rumor and gossip and, and condemnation and prejudice and all the things that we can say are as, as uh, damaging as anything that we can do to one another. It is an absolute falsehood when we say, sticks and stones can hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words hurt and our tongues, we need to control them. And that's, that would save a whole lot of grief in this world. It would save a whole lot of grief in marriages. It would save a whole lot of grief in the church. Your tongue. So he's going to talk about that a little bit today, about what we say. Now, is that consistent with Jesus' message? Jesus said in Matthew 12, For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. So it really speaks what's in your hearts. So be careful. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And Jesus gives us a, a, a key to bridling our tongues. A key. And it's that command from James to do that. He says it's really what's in here. And he says in the mouth does spurt out stuff that's horrible. And I, and I didn't quote this one, but he, in that same section, he says, and each one of you will be judged on what you say. I want some of that back. I want some of that back. And, and here's the thing. Justification. It, what we say and what we do doesn't affect the fact that we are God's children. We're going to heaven. And he loves us. But sanctification is what really God wants us to be cleaned up. How do you say it in other ways? You know, it's like we're fishers of men, we catch the fish, God cleans them. Uh, you know, uh, God loves you just as you are, but he, does, he loves you so much he does not want you to stay there. He wants you to become more and more like him. Sanctification is our lifetime endeavor to become more godly. And that's where behavior matters. That's where what we do matters. Today's gospel, Jesus said then, from, it's from within. From the human heart, then evil intentions come. And then he lists that whole list of sinfulness, which I don't need to go over. I think our hearts know that what is sin and what is not. See, all these evil things come from within. They defile the person. James says, then rid yourself of all these soreness and rank growth of wickedness. And welcome with meekness. And this is important. The implanted word that has the power to save your soul. The first step to a clean, clean heart is to, is to um, implant the Word in there. The Word of God tells us what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Uh, friends on television does not indicate to us what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior. The movie we saw was rated R, that has uh, both killing and, and licentious living and all of that kind of stuff is not the indicator of what's right and wrong. And yet we feed ourselves with that stuff. And we let that tell us what's right and wrong. The Word of God is what planted inside of us. And James so then is going to lead us to the Word of God. Jesus and James then go hand in hand with much of what they do. There's not a paradox of works. It's that when we receive the grace and blessing of Christ, and we seek first the kingdom of God, then all the rest of the things that drive us will come to you. So how do we do that? I just got some pretty real brief beginnings because we're going to be dealing with James' letter for three weeks. How do we obtain a pure heart? And is it important? Remember when David, we were reading the story of David this past summer. And David sinned before. And it was because his heart got lazy. We talked about that. He was sitting up on the top of his roof and he was just kind of let his, back, his, uh, his warriors take care of the battle, and he just looks down, and he lusts after Bathsheba. He calls her up, 
you know the rest of the story. He has Bathsheba's husband killed. I mean, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And after he gets confronted with his sin, he knew where the, that evil came from. He created me a clean heart, O oh God. Sustain the right spirit within me. So how do we clean our hearts? How do we at least recognize some of the things that we need to do in our heart? First of all, I think we need to ask ourselves, what is my treasure? What do I treasure more so than God? That's a hard question. What is the most important thing in my life? Because Jesus said this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, if I treasure success, or I treasure uh, uh, my stuff, or if I treasure acceptance of others, more so than acceptance of God, if I treasure my own self-worth and what I do for me, rather than, than you know, uh, the approval of God in my life and what I do for others. There's all those kinds of things. And it really gets down even to family. And that's the tough one. That's where we, you know, God wants us to put in first. That's going to be our treasure. Now, where your treasure is, your heart will be. But if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, what happens? All these other things will come to you. So it's about our priorities. And really when we discover, and that's a hard discovery for all of us, what do I really treasure? And then we can start giving it to God. And we can start rearranging what's important. Uh, you know? No, I don't know. Because I was going to talk about... No. Well, I was going to talk about playing golf on Sunday morning. <laughs> a day like this would be a really good golf game. We need to God is the bigger question. Okay, second question that I think is, is so important to us when we discover who we treasure, to ask ourselves what or who controls my life? Who controls my life? Who, who is, it? is it? Is it me or is it the way that God control my life as I go through? Is my life controlled by uh, an electronic device? Is my life controlled by somebody in this world? Is my life controlled by my old nature or by the Spirit of God? For in Romans, Paul said, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature anymore, but by the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, then you can allow that to control your life. Now, if the Spirit of God is going to drive us to God. And it's going to allow God to massage our heart and do the heart surgery that some of us need. Because remember, it's out of our heart that we speak and we do that. And finally, the third uh, uh, advice or the third question to ask ourselves, what are you feeding yourself? What are you eating? We talked about that uh, you know, in the last five weeks. I have the bread of life. I have come, you know, that you have eternal life when you feed on me. Of course, it's spiritual food. Well, what are, you, what are you putting in? Because what you put in comes out, right? You are what you eat. Garbage in, garbage out on the computer. Are you, are you, are you getting fed by things that are of God? Or not? You know, I, I, don't, I know they're, they're trying to justify some of these war games that are on uh, uh, computers are full of, of, you know, we have Grand Theft Auto. Now, it might be innocent games because you're not really staying in the car, but you're feeding yourself with this attitude of, of theft and stuff. Or, or you, you might be murdering people out in the streets and, on these, some of these games, and, and that becomes, that's scary to me. And I'm not saying that it, it damages or drives our children, but how can it be? We did a study when I was doing my doctoral work about how many times since the last 15 years a young person, even in cartoons, sees somebody die on TV. And it hasn't been that life is, is less precious in this age of ours. I, I see a correlation. I see a correlation. What we feed ourselves is important. And, and we need to feed ourselves on God. I am the living water. 
I'll quench thirst. And that living water is the Spirit of God. And over these weeks, we have seen how God can feed our hearts and when we, when we ponder Him and pray to Him. And remember, He said, don't seek the food that perishes. Seek the food that leads to eternal life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger and never thirst again. What does that mean? It means when we partake, not only the physical partaking of the Eucharist, but just eating Jesus and, and taking him in. He said, I am the good shepherd. Who is your shepherd? Jesus will protect us. And if we, if we allow ourselves to be humble enough to allow God to protect us, he will guide the way. He will protect us. And a thief might come in and steal us away. Be careful. And so that's, that's another thing that, you know, that, to, that protects our heart. I am the vine. If you keep plugged into me, you're going to get that life-giving sap that actually is going to produce fruit in you. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the truth. I am the way. And I am the life. Uh, truth is an important part of seeking God's truth, not our own. Because truth is, in our day and age has become quite relative, doesn't it? It's subjective. Whatever you believe is okay. Where to say that? So anyway, here's the thing. What you're putting in, what you're feeding yourself with. If you're feeding yourself with the culture of the world, you are going to not uh, be healthy. Your heart is going to be worldly, and you're going to do worldly things. And you're going to say worldly things. But if you're feeding yourself with God, then our hearts begin to change. And as Paul will say a little bit later, we'll see it change. When that happens, we do reflect God. And it feels good. It is good for us. It is good for our families. It is good for our jobs. And it's good for those who we come in contact with. And it's good for each other. Because we will live in peace and joy and harmony. So, don't be afraid of the hard lessons and, and, and that we're going to be hearing over the next couple of weeks. What are we going to be hearing? Well, we'll be hearing things like religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this. I love that. What is religion? Is religion going to the church every Sunday? Is religion you know, eating certain foods? Is religion fasting on a certain day? You know, religion is that care for orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself from staying from the world. It's what you do. It comes from here, taking care of each other, forgiving them, loving them. And then he's, we're going to talk about, again, over these next weeks, what is real justice? What is fairness? What does it mean to be prejudiced and prejudge others? For, for, for you know, he's going to say, don't do that. Partiality, favoritism, and all of those things that we tend to fall into. He's going to talk even more about the danger of the tongue and how destructive it can be as we, we, we give it to God. We're going to learn about wisdom. We're going to learn about patience. We're going to learn about prayer. We're going to learn about healing. We're going to learn about confession. All of those things that, that James is bringing to us to supplement our, our life of, of growing into the fullness of Christ. And really, really uh, living in that realm. And I got some good news for you. Because you are saved, and because we are saved, that's what heaven's like. Might as well prepare for it now so we're not shocked when we get there that we can't do whatever we want. <laughs> so let's learn. And let God really change our hearts, because that's where it all starts. And it starts in prayer, it starts in study. It, it, it continues as we allow the Spirit of God to dwell in us and to cleanse our hearts. And it ends in joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, 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 oh. Before I, before, before I finish, I have to tell you the story. Yesterday I had a wedding. And our first lesson from the Song of Solomon, which you read beautifully, was the lesson from the wedding. Come away, my love. Come away with me. And it was written by the Solomon, right? So if you think about Solomon, what, what does he know? Wisdom. How wise was Solomon? Because he ended up with 700 wives <laughs> and 300 concubines. That's a paradox. 